This podcast has been brought to you by our Patreon account. After almost four years of producing free content in one way or another, we're finally opening up the doors for people to uh, financially support us. For anyone out there that supports what we're doing, believes in us, believes in what we're trying to achieve, uh, feel free to head over to patreon.com forward slash XY advisor. And second of all, we've uh, finally converted our mainly dormant website into a membership site now. It is focused on training. You pay $49 a month, you get one credit to spend uh, on the library of different training courses and those training courses are constantly getting upgraded and constantly getting added to. Uh, We actually give half the money to the course providers because we value what they do. Uh, It's just a really good way for us to, to improve upon the financial advice community. So that's everything. Enjoy the podcast. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client's Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments. They're really, really cheap and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout because they're doing some really cool stuff. So I hear that I need to ask you about the time that you took nine friends sailing in Croatia. Yes, you do. Is that where you want to start? Tell us. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, in my wisdom, I decided to be a really good idea to go sailing in Croatia, which doesn't sound so unusual because I actually grew up sailing. So I sort of knew what I was doing. But um, I ended up going and doing my navigation skills course in London. I was living in London at the time. And uh, I picked... Uh, there were nine in total friends to go and I picked them very carefully because I know you can get into a whole lot of uh, not so good places when you go sailing. Uh, what I had failed to do in my uh, preparations was learn Croatian because when <laughs> I got there, I couldn't understand the maps, I couldn't understand the, the skeds, I couldn't understand the locals and it was the end of season and there were a lot of problems with the boat and the boat kept conking out and uh, we had to sail into anchor and caught the entire bay's uh, you know, they're just sitting there sipping their wine at the end of the day <laughs> and we're going aground. Eventually we pulled it out and we managed to get the boat anchored, but it was uh, a harrowing experience. Are you beached right. yourself yeah, in the boat? Almost, yeah, oh. we came off. But um, I think what, what was really interesting for me from the point of view is that I picked the people really carefully, so I think there's a lot of analogies there around picking the right team around you. And I also had the right people on the right job, so much to my girl power... Um, problem. I actually sent all the girls down below and I just had the guys on deck because I needed their strength and their height to be able to get the sails down and lose the wind really, really quickly. So, um, yes, not one of my brighter times. But good team management. Good team management. Yes. One of the guys on the boat had a cigarette for the first time in his life. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. So, okay, so we're talking people today. Mm. Uh, So tell me firstly, what are the biggest mistakes that people make with people? Yeah, the biggest mistakes is three things. If the, if business owners could just do three things better, they'd have a, a lift in their productivity and their profitability, which is hire well, manage well, and fire well. You know, that really, it is as simple as getting really good at that stuff. But I think as a general comment, most people have never been taught how to be a great people manager. You know, if you ask people, did you learn that at uni? Or, you know, what did you learn about people management skills? They've got zip, zero. And obviously, they get promoted to that role of manager, and then... We give them a technical component of their role, which takes up 90, 95%, and we leave 5% for the management side of it, which, you know, it should be sort of like 60 or 70% as management, you know, the rest of it's technical, uh, if you want to get the most productivity out of the people in your team. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. And people don't know how to hire well, they don't know how to do great interviews, and they bring people in on this, the gut, and the gut tells them to hire, and then they end up with all sorts of mistakes, and then we end up coming in and doing the other part of it, which is the firing part. Right. So how, how do people avoid the, the mistakes? How do you learn these things? I think you need to educate yourself, and um, I think a great way to start to educate yourself is one way, is read my book, which is called From High to Fire and Everything in Between. I deliberately wrote it to become a dog-eared companion for business owners to go, oh, I need to have one of those oh, tough conversations. Let's turn to page 106 or whatever it is. And I think- Can you, you- just bookmark it and leave it on their yes. table? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> just be like- 
reading before our next meeting. <laughs> yes, it's a little preparation for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I think it's. I think you get better at it. Um, try and pick a mentor, somebody who you, who you look up to, who you think is a really good manager, to try and help you and test your ideas out. So if you've got to have one of those awkward conversations or you're not sure how to manage something, you can run it by them first, and they can give you some good coaching and mentoring. I think that's really important. So are you saying that even um, people like Clayton Daniel could become a good manager over time? Yes, of course. I think you are totally uh, overestimating the power of your book. <laughs> look, there think, is very little hope. Oh, look, I think, you know, a big part of it that we joke about it, but it is desire. You know, if you are a manager of people, you actually need to like people and you actually need uh, to want to get the out best the out of them. <laughs> but, we, but we don't even, sometimes we start a business not even knowing that we'll have one employee, let alone five, 10, 15 employees over over time so we don't even have a chance to practice the skills before we're actually in the in, job of managing people yeah when we were off air we were talking before didn't we i have a client that you may actually know and she said natasha running a business would be so much fun if i didn't have to have employees totally and agreed yeah and everyone feels like that because it's not necessarily you went into business because you're a financial planner and you love numbers and you love creating wealth that's why you went into business the byproduct is most businesses to grow need people mm, and then you sort of go oh i've got to do that bit of it literally uh the only thing that solves that problem is if you meet someone called emily blanche <laughs> who who is the full-time staff here at xy visor and she's an absolute killer like i can't even underestimate or overestimate how how good she is um but besides that i've had appalling experiences yeah. with hiring and firing in fact i just did it the other day I had, to, one? I had to uh, fire someone yeah. and it was so bad, mm. it was so bad. It generally doesn't leave a good taste in your mouth and I think what we find is that the reason why you want to exit someone from your business is really valid mm. and if we walk down the street and use the reasonableness test, you know, would most people say, yeah, that guy's got to go or that girl's got to go, they're not cutting it. The, the issue for small business is that it's quite a complex process to let somebody go and they'll generally fail the unfair dismissal test. Now, the unfair dismissal mm. test says, was the termination harsh, unjust or unreasonable? And there's a whole lot of things you need to do to try and make sure that you're not doing a termination in that way. One example is providing a support person. So if you've got to have one of those yucky conversations, you need to say to that individual, you know, we need to have a difficult conversation. Do you want to bring someone in to support you? Now, if and you don't, who are they? Are it they, could be Can I go mum? down the street or, could, or I've got to wait yeah. for their mum to come in? You've got to wait till their mum comes in. Okay. And if they, if mum's not available today, you need to feasibly reschedule that meeting. Okay. Now, the reason for that is... <laughs> if someone had to bring their mum into a meeting, <laughs> yeah. there's a good reason they're getting but fired. Imagine <laughs> you're, but imagine you then, not only are you firing them, <laughs> then you're embarrassing them in front of their mum as well. well that's, oh, that's really tough. That's so it's awkward. Like, mum, I got fired and you were there What? And you saw it. <laughs> um, look, I think the reason for it is, is that many people have been fired very appallingly in the past. And, and the reason why they do that is often when you're in that situation, you're stressed, you're not listening, your, your mind's churning, you're thinking you're out of a job, and therefore you're not hearing what's being said to you. So that support person is there to say, well, remember when Ben said this, I think that's what he meant by that, or they're not there to argue the point for you, they're there to provide emotional support to the individual who's going through it. So it might be mum. Mm. <laughs> And so, uh, with the with the hiring, you talked about the the, the importance of, of getting that right. What do you think, like for um, if you think about f uh, financial advice businesses, mm -hmm. and I think it's probably fair to say that at least uh, maybe I'm just uh, uh, sort of pushing out my how I feel about things. But a lot of financial advisors they're really good at what they do. Like you say, they're technical. They like working with people, but not necessarily managing people. What's the what's the best approach for? for financial advisors to, to grow their business? To what? hire the best? Yeah. I think there's a couple of things. One is that um, the old traditional sourcing strategy of SEEK is still valid, but it's not as good as what it was. So what we've seen is a massive shift in the market. In the good old days, you could put an ad in SEEK and you would get 100 responses of which 20 could do the job standing on their head. So it didn't matter which one took it as long as one of them did. You put that same ad out now, you'll get 20 responses of which two can do the job. Really? Why? There's a, My personal opinion on this is that um, for you guys are probably too young, but there used to be something called Thank the you. training <laughs> training guarantee levy, which said that all businesses had to spend 1% of their 
uh, mm. payroll on training. Mm. Now, yes, there were jollies to, it was a Keating uh, initiative, there were jollies to Bali, but what really came about as a, as, as a part of that was that people were actually trained in their jobs. And then we hit the global financial crisis, so people lost their jobs. Uh, training went first, then people lost their jobs, then it took a while for them to get back into the market, and things have been tied ever since. So there's two markets. There's the passive candidate, they're the ones who are actively looking, the financial advisors who are actively looking, and and then there's what we could, sorry, the active candidates are the ones that are looking and then you have the passive candidates. They're the ones that if you top, tap them on the shoulder, they go, actually, I'd, I'd be interested in having a chat. Don't forget, people are quite nervous about moving at the moment. There's a myth, um, sort of a mentality of better the devil you know mm. out there. Um, and so I think use multiple sourcing channels, do great interviews. So minimum of two interviews for all you guys. Uh, one is going to focus on the technical. Can they do the job? But most people think, I need 100%. You don't. Mm. Try and hire for about 60 to 70 percent of the technical teach the rest because otherwise if you're hiring at 100 they're going to be bored and out the door if you haven't got a career progression for them and expensive and expensive and then we can talk about when we talked about what some of the costs are the second thing is do a behavioral interview behavioral interviews are past behavior indicates future performance so if you know in your business that there are going to be times in the financial year you're going to put them under enormous amount of pressure they're going to have to get a whole lot of client stuff done design a question around that so tell me about a time when you had more work than you could possibly handle what happened and what did you do and you get them to give you a brief overview of synopsis and then you pick a key event so it might be in that meeting what were you thinking going into that meeting what did you say mm. what did you do what was your role can you give me an example can you see if somebody answered all those questions behaviors start popping out and you can start to say quick study or bias fraction or attention to detail don't but people just lie though when not when you no, do that well right. if you like what i've found in the past is that if they try to generically answer that question, you know they're lying. Yeah. So if someone can actually come up with a specific example mm -hmm. of this was the client, this was the angry phone call, this is what I did, this is how I spoke to her, and this was the outcome, and it's a true example, you know they're lying. Okay. If they go, oh, what I'd probably do mm -hmm. is call the client, then call the advisor and try to make the client mm -hmm. happy, they're making it up. Yeah, it so should it's feel the like specifics. It, they should be able to tell you what the story is. Yeah, it should feel like you're a fly on the wall watching it play out. That's mm. how when it's done well. The last one is you need to do a cultural interview. Guess what? We run our own businesses. We get to decide the culture of our business. And the quickest way for someone to fail in a business is then they're a cultural mismatch. So questions like, tell me about the favorite place to work you've worked. Why was it your favorite? Tell me about your favorite boss. What is important to you when when you go to work? Is it a place that gives back? Is it a place that, um, you know, is all about results? You know, so that you start to see, is there a match or is there going to be a disconnect here? Um, when Ben and I decided to work together, we uh, one of the things that we came up with was uh, tests on how good each other's personality was. So I would just uh, stalk around from time to time and uh, completely unsolicited would shoot him with a paintball. And, uh, and just find out uh, how he felt about that. Or at least that may not have actually happened, but I'm sure you felt like it was happening from time to time. <laughs> um, it was quite funny. We're, we're, we're first sort of 18 months that we were doing XY, it was Ben and I were pretty much just constantly at, at each other. But it's, it's calmed down uh, mostly now. Thankfully, uh, it's Adrian that gets most of Ben's disdain, which is great that, it, that the focus is off me now. <laughs> we figured out we, we we figured out that Clay uh, is abrupt and and can't manage anyone. So <laughs> we stopped asking him questions or listening to his responses. But he recently <laughs> took a, he recently took a test and figured out that out you know, if he's in a room with a hundred people. <laughs> He is the least polite person <laughs> in that room. He's the zeroth percentile. So uh, that made me feel uh, slightly better that it's just, he's just, it's like um, picking on a disabled person. Uh, so, so, so we won't do so that. So Clayton can be our non-performing employee. <laughs> exactly. And so hypothetically, if he was our non-performing non employee, what do we do? Let's do a case study. Yeah, yeah. let's do a case study. Well, the first thing is to have a conversation. And this is what we call the informal part of the process and people need to get better at giving feedback and people generally aren't very good at it they don't 
like having that conversation and you need to get better at listening. So I'd be calling Clayton in and saying, look, you know. Okay, I gotta, I gotta get comfortable for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Performance review. I've been fired before. <laughs> I know how this You've goes. You've never been fired during a podcast though. <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> I used to be known as the angel of death. That's oh probably my not God. a good thing. <laughs> I'd let go about 50 people in London. Uh, not, good, not good. Which company George was this Clooney? for? No, I'm not saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professional services company. Anyway, um, so you need to be able to say to them, when you do this, this is the reaction. Can you tell me why that's happening? Okay. And listen. And use things like mirroring. So, you know, explain that to me in a little bit more detail. Or can I just check that I can understand you? Because potentially you're not performing because we haven't actually given you the tools or the resources or the time to do your job. So that's what we call an informal discussion. If it keeps going and it's not improving, then you're probably more into that stage where you might need to say to them, look, we need to have a serious chat with you. You might like to bring a support person on because... My and mom. then, yeah, bring your mum. <laughs> and and the conversation would go in a similar way, but you need to start documenting. And I would have even put a file note when you one. had that first yeah. conversation to say... Is there protections for small businesses? Yes, there are. Yeah. So if... So this is the protection, and everyone um, who's listening, write this down because it's a really important number. If you have under fifteen employees, they can't take an employee can't take you for unfair dismissal if they have less than twelve months service. Oh. If you have okay. o- fifteen or over, they can take you after twelve months service. So six months for under 15, 12 months for 15 and over. Now, what does that mean? If you are taken, uh, so what would happen if you had a complaint raised against you? Is the first thing you'll hear from is the Fair Work Ombudsman. You have to fill about eight pages of paperwork and attend a mediation. And that will take a couple of hours and they'll try and resolve the situation. If you're deemed to have failed that unfair dismissal test, you can be fined up to six months salary to be paid to that individual and or reinstatement. (sighs) Guys, better watch out. You wouldn't really want to be reinstated though, Clay. No, no. (laughs) But guess what? Don't don't accept that one. They will push it if they're near 45 or over 45 and the relationship is not too badly damaged because obviously once you're over 45, it can be harder to find a job. So they Mm. may push for that reinstatement. The ombudsman may yes. push for reinstatement. Yeah. Could you okay. imagine? Oh, I'm like, horrendous. it's like people want to get divorced and then the judge going, no, nah. just <laughs> suck it up. Exactly. <laughs> so even though we're protected, there's still likely lots of costs associated with mm. doing that if we do it the wrong way. If you do it the wrong way, yes, because that I haven't included your time costs mm. in that. You know, we've developed an unfair dismissal calculator on our website to try and get Uh, businesses give them an idea of what it will cost them if it goes wrong and depending on how far through the process they go. um, So they actually get it right first go. Mm. You know, they get some advice, they document it properly. And the other thing I would say is it should never come as a shock to Clayton when he's actually fired. fired. Mm. So the last in the second last meeting, (laughs) I will say to him, if your performance does not improve, your role is at risk of termination. So that when he turns up next time, yes, it could have all been improved and he's got to the levels of performance we need, or he knows he's probably coming in and, you know, it should never be a shock. Uh, ben and I used to work at a place and uh, I was living under the, the threat of uh, firing for, I don't know, about six months. And for the first few months, Ben walked in. He was like, hey, guys, look, let me give Clayton. I'll bring him under my wing. I'll look after him. Just give me a couple of months (laughs) and I'll sort him out. A couple of months later, he's like, yeah, I've given up. (laughs) (laughs) There's only so much a man can do. (laughs) He was really bad. (laughs) And you you just, history repeats itself. And you're still mates (laughs) of sorts. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, we're business partners now. Now we work together, but no one, no one's allowed to tell anyone else what to do. So, to do. so <laughs> don't, it's don't a, listen to Clay. Let him create win-win. things. He's not non-performing. He's, he performs j- just not in conversations and instructions. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you raise a really good point around trying to understand fit. So we talked earlier about Harrison's assessment. So you'll be familiar with psychometrics like DISC or Myers Briggs. You're also familiar with Wealth Dynamics we that has it place as well. Mm. Yeah. So DISC, you know, uh, sorry, Myers Briggs extra introvert, introvert, you've probably worked out which one I am. What I love about Harrison's is they've mapped 6,500 jobs worldwide. And it will say, is Natasha a fit to be a HR manager? Yes, she's a 75% fit. But then it goes one step further. It lists all of my traits in terms of uh, mandatory, desirable, and nice to have for that role. So, you know, when you work with someone after a while and you work out maybe great attention to detail or great Mm. client service, you work that out over time of Mm. working with them. Usually takes a couple of months. With this, you actually know how to point them to their strengths from day one. 
And it's okay. a really powerful tool. There's, there's a company called Hatch. They're a startup. And it, it um, examines someone's social media uh, you know, exposure or life or mm. data or whatever. It comes up with a personality profile. And then, um, and then when the employer, they do a bunch of tests and they put their culture in. And then this company called Hatch... Wow. says uh, whether or not they would be a good cultural fit. That's crazy. Hey, and, and it's becoming more and more of a, our social media life and what we see. Quick wall story on this. A couple of years ago, we were hiring for a, a corporate travel company and it was a fellow and he was great. You know, on paper, he was fantastic, but he was going to work with um, six women in an office and an MD male. And so what did the women do when the MD came out of the interview? They Facebook Googling stalked him. him. Yep. <laughs> and unfortunately, he'd had a whole lot of very inappropriate conversations about female genitalia and did not realise his pub- his profile was, la- uh, oh. was public. And so we actually had to <laughs> rescind the offer because he was going to be working for a very high-profile person that you guys would know. And we couldn't risk that person finding out about that. And it, we couldn't have him in the office because the women were like, oh, we don't want anyone who speaks like that. Mm, and so he lost it. Enough. And he was mortified when we rang to say we've had to rescind. <laughs> And I think he learned a very um, important lesson about social media. And it doesn't go away. You know, what you post, it's there for life. (laughs) Especially young kids that are coming through now. You know, they need to be really careful that they don't have the drunk photo because people look at that. I think we have to be careful Mm. as well because there's a lot of, there are a lot of John Smiths. Like I've heard more stories of people Googling their employee that was going to come in for the interview. And then when they walk in the door, they're the, they're the different person. And so they've already got this idea that mm. I'm going to meet this person, interview them, and I've got a negative feeling about it because I've looked at their social media. But then they've looked at the wrong social media. Exactly. Um, and you, <laughs> you're looking at the wrong person, but you don't know that till you get the, get into the room with the and person. And then you've got that, you know, unconscious you've bias. You've got that unconscious bias from, the, from day one. But mm. I'm a fan of the falling into the psychometric testing mm. world. Um, it just works. And... I think that it's really important to build that into part of the hiring pl- process because not only does it tell you if it's a good hire, but the, the outputs from whatever tool you use helps you manage that person going forward. You understand if, they, if they're if they a morning person or a night person mm-hmm. or they're detailed orientated and you can work to those strengths over, over time and otherwise you just don't know it or you've got to learn the hard way. Yeah. What, what do you use? We use a one called People Logica. People mm-hmm. Logica. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think it's I think the point is it's one data point and mm. you should have lots of data points when you're interviewing to mm. your point earlier about how do you make sure you hire the best. You know, uh, great interview technique, great interviews, reference checks, background checks, we haven't gone there yet. Psychometrics, um, reference checks, you must reference check. Um, because people always say to me, well, they're just going to give me their mates' names. Well, they will if you let them. You know, as you go through the interview, say, well, when you worked for, um, you know, ABC company, who did you report into and what was their role? And you do that for each of the roles down. And then if you get to the bottom of the CV and it's George Smith and you haven't heard anything about George, well, who's George? Mm. You know, so you need to get smarter about who you're doing reference checking with. And, uh, and unfortunately, on the social media side, the law has not caught up with it yet. You know, in terms of people using social media to make a decision on hiring, oh, Are you allowed or to? discriminating. You're allowed to. Well, technically, at the moment, you can. Yeah. Unless it's not an obviously discriminate. Oh, you know, unless yeah. they could run an oh, argument. So, with discrimination. So, so technically, what you're suggesting could happen in the future is that gentleman that you were mentioning, who had an abysmal social media mm. profile, he could at some point turn around and say, "I've been." Uh, disadvantaged because of social media or wow. the other side of it is you as an employer if we and that's the thing the blurring of the lines between what's social and what's business well, let's all think about it my facebook started as a personal thing it's now a business tool yeah so totally. it's my <laughs> friends that see what i did with my kids on the weekend but it's also my business colleagues that see what i did with the kids on the weekend yeah. so there's a real blurring of the lines there and that's making it complicated so you know people employers are checking people's social media but is that fair? You know, what's the boundary between the work life mm. and the personal you life? You are allowed to have an opinion. And that opinion, just because you have a different point of view outside of the workplace, mm-hmm. doesn't mean the workplace has the right to c- consider that opinion for hiring or firing people. Mm. Unless it dishes the business publicly, mm. then you're in slander territory. 
Mm. And so just going back to the, with the hiring, you're talking about that, that profile that you use, mm. is that something, do you use that with everyone? Is that, would you say that? And, and I know that you, you're familiar with the wealth dynamics mm. as well. Do you, does the, is that already covered in the other profile so, that you mentioned? And is that important? So in my business, I do wealth dynamic, dynamics as well as Harrison's. Um, uh-huh. So wealth dynamics gives you a, a more of a personality profile and approach. So we were joking before about you potentially being a creator. Yes. Do you remember what you were? Yeah, yeah, I'm the the first one that they mentioned. At right up at the top, creator, yeah. and then star. Have you got star on? No, I, okay. I'm not. I don't have the star material at all. The, crea- <laughs> the creator, though, I was like on the edge. So your big picture. Definitely. Yeah, not, not, don't like, so yeah. So I'm a star creator and then I'm married to and my GM and some of my top team members are all lords. So lord profiles in, in our wealth dynamics are attention to detail, don't like change. <laughs> Settle down, Natasha. Don't go too fast. <laughs> you know, where I'm a bit more prolific rather than perfect, let's just go for it. Yeah. Um, so that's wealth dynamics. Um, Harrison's is more the match to the job. Uh-huh. So I think they both have a place. Right. And again, it's another data point. In terms of how we use it, what we noticed was we used to not use it in our recruitment process, our recruitment package. And then we'd say, oh, would you like to do a, a psychometric test now? And they're like, no, no I've already paid you. my money. Yeah. I'm done. So then we included it in the profile, uh, sorry, in the package so that when they pr- pick their best candidate, we'd say, right now we're going to do the profile on them. Mm. What that's done is lift the uh, the success because you've got people who don't know what they're doing interviewing, mm-hmm. lift the success of those recruitment pieces and the the anecdotal information, the two times people said, we said they've failed the test and they go, don't worry, we're going to take them on anyway. Don't Didn't work didn't out. Learn. Right. Yeah. The test works. Cool. Okay. So And so what do you think for a, like, if I look at, say my business or a small financial planning business if you if you want to grow or you know that you need to grow in terms of your people what what do you think is the is the best approach to that do you need to sort of look you know way down the track and say this is what i want my business to look like and start sort of building that out now or do you just solve for because it's easy to obviously to solve for the the biggest problem at the time mm-hmm. What do you, what do you I think, think you do need to do both. You need to solve the problem now and get the resources. Uh, you need to make sure that they're effective, though. Most people put someone in a seat and expect them to learn biosmosis. Mm. And, you know, they don't invest the time in the onboarding. They don't invest the time in you training them up because you're so, you know, busy and your head's spinning. You just go, there's your desk. Go for it. Mm. And that doesn't set them up for success. And people are at the greatest risk of resigning in the first three months that you've jo- uh, they've joined. That's a really expensive time for mm. them, them to resign, especially if they're good. So, But also, to your point, you need to have an org chart of your vision. You know, what's your business going to look like in 12 months if everything comes off? You know, and also that helps with the recruiting process because they're actually, hey, Ben's thinking what the business looks like in 12 months, two years, three years, five years. Mm. And I can see there's a career path for me if I hang around. So okay. it's both. Uh huh. And so, but what I think what what happens with most, especially solo businesses, like I know I did this when I started my business. Um, it was just me, and then you just do everything as yes. a financial advisor. So, and then you have to push, push, push to grow the business, and then like you pay for a staff member, it's a significant cost. So you push, you push a, until like to wait until you, like the final possible moment, <laughs> and then you like go, okay, now I'm going to spend the money and get someone. But in that moment, you you have put yourself in a position Too where you, you're extremely busy and then it's and then it's extremely difficult to spend that time mm. um mm. with with the with the training and the but onboarding to be fair, so you, you have a bit of a uh, track record with that just, just dipping back into when ben and i used to work together again my very first day ben literally and i love telling the story because it actually happened you got a, a manila folder and just came and dumped it on my desk and goes, get that done. And then walks <laughs> off again. <laughs> I'm like... I wasn't a manager. I was, I like, was an what? analyst. I was like, what, what, what am I... But he was lower on the pecking order, yeah, wasn't he? Man- <laughs> yeah, there's a manager for that. And, and you, you had it done by five. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. As that's, you needed that's, to. That's management material there. <laughs> Look, I, I think there's a whole lot of things in that space. I think, you know, has set them up for ses- to success, do a great um, orientation, do check-in calls. So most people sit at their desk and they finish day one and everyone's like, oh, you're coming back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of the extent of it. Why don't we sit down and have a conversation? What surprised you? What did you learn about the business today that you didn't know? What are we doing that you think we could be doing better? Don't forget these guys have got insights. So do a great job description. Most people don't bother with job descriptions. But if 
I don't communicate to you what your job is. How are you supposed to be successful? And more so, if we don't know what everyone's doing, how do we know that all the pieces in the puzzle are actually going to give us the outcome we want? Mm. So, w- so do you, it, with the like this, the resourcing thing, though, what do you do when you don't have the time? Do you just have to hire before so, you... So I think work? everyone goes straight away, I've got to fi- hire a full-time permanent employee. You don't. So I, what I would caution everyone with, and I'll say this up front, is I would caution everyone against hiring independent contractors or get some very good legal advice. And the reason why I say that is they're a really high-risk instrument to hire. Fair Work don't like them and nor do the ATO. And there's two reasons for that. Fair Work don't like them because they think you are trying to um, uh, uh, um, avoid paying minimum entitlements, like long service, annual leave and yeah. all that sort of stuff. But even with super, with mm. independent contractors, you've got to pay super now. Um, the other reason is that um, uh, ATO don't like them because guess what? They pay tax in arrears. They want pay as you go, people. I see. So yeah. they've made it incredibly hard. So a lot of people have old misconceptions about 80 20 rule and all this sort of stuff. It is very hard to have a true independent contractor in a business. But look at things like casual employees that, you know, most of most of the modern awards allow you to have a casual employee to pay. You've got to check your award, but for 12 months. You know, so you can have somebody on board casually. You don't know what the ebbs and flows of the business are. Mm-hmm. Think about someone permanent part-time or someone on a fixed-term contract. So you could say, come in for three months. I think I've got three months. I think I can fund you for three months. Then we'll see and we'll either negotiate an open-ended contract or another fixed term. So there's other ways of mm-hmm. doing it rather than jumping straight into permanent full-time. I see. And and so once you get the person in, you find the right person and, and take all of those steps, what do you think are the, are the best ways to um, to keep your staff motivated? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of engagement. So engagement is the measure of discretionary effort. So what will keep you working in the office at 11 o'clock at night because there's a client deadline, not because you're getting paid overtime, um, so but the threat of being fired. <laughs> yeah, it <might laughs> be. Not at all. <laughs> it might be. What would keep you there? So, so the statistics are, and there was a lot of research done out of, I think it was Harvard, that said businesses that score seventy five percent and above for their engagement average across the business, in comparison to businesses that are in the lowest percentile, the twenty fifth percentile and under, get twenty one percent more product productivity, 20% more profitability. So most people would want a bit of that. So how do you build that engagement? Number one is communication. Who of your listeners has the communication strategy about how you're going to communicate with your employees? Yeah, right. Okay. Mm, Most wouldn't. Not me. So, mm. you know, think about talk, what I'll people... Talk to them. <laughs> talk yes. loud. I just bring my soapbox in and stand. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Here you. <laughs> Here it is. Get so, back to it. <laughs> so think about what they want to hear, how frequently they want to hear, and what are the channels for that. So one of the tools I use, I have a virtual team of 12, we use Voxer. And Voxer is a, like a walkie-talkie app. Mm. And so when I'm out and about on the road, I can just go, hi, guys, this is where we're at. We've built this. We've just won three new clients. Um, and a shout out to Helen because she's just doing an amazing job oh, and it takes me two or three up. minutes and it's a free app mm. and literally people are working but they're hearing what's going on in the business and that keeps them interested and engaged um, then more broadly you need to have regular catch-ups with your team quarterly take a half day do some training do some knowledge sharing have a long lunch I've just written a, a blog for flying solo going we need to bring back the long lunch mm. for I've clients been, I've kept it going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about what about like Tim Tams in the what Tim Tams in the kitchen. That can be it, you know, if that's what people want, do it. You know, ask Dean, them. You know what Dean they, wants yeah. the three dollar solution. Ask oh, them. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell he's got some stuff. How many? <laughs> Is it Tim Tams or a yeah. Monte Carlo? Yeah. No, I know someone who quit because they cut the Tim Tams during the GFC. <laughs> yeah, and look, there were people like that. And the fruit. And I think to your oh, point, yeah. Ben, ask yeah. them. So mm. one of the things that you guys could do is what we call stay interviews. So they're not exit interviews. It's a it's an interview once every six months that says, what do you love about what you're doing? What is really hacking you off? Uh, what would make you stay here in 12 months? What would make you stay here in three years? Actually ask them. And they'll tell you in the mm. most... And, and, it, and then, because it's different for everyone. If we asked everyone around this table at the moment, what's going to keep you doing your job for another six months or six years? It's going to be very different. So you need to tailor that. Salary is just one component. And interestingly, the number one attractor for people at the moment, candidates, is flexibility. Mm. Salary is seven on the scale these days. Mm. So yes, it's important. And yes, it needs to have met the minimum legal requirements. But yeah. people want to be able to work from home. They want to go and see the kids at the cross-country carnival. They want 
to have gone out late partying and know that you know that they're going to work on the weekend and catch it up you just need to flex depending on who's in the and I think in the environment that's kind of useful for a small business because we don't always have the ability to pay higher than average market rates yeah. to mm. retain to attract the best staff and mm. so if we can add these extra things around the outside that sometimes are, are effectively free but you get a very big return on flexible working for example mm. um, they're the important things to actually build into the yeah. I suppose like the job offer mm. we're going to pay you X but in addition to that this is what we provide yeah I think one of the things I'd encourage your listeners to do is to tap into what I call a gold mine of talent which is actually females who have left the workplace because the larger end of talent aren't they talk about flexibility but they're not all really doing it oh this is the the young mothers the young mm. mums and do you know what you get they are so grateful for a job i've heard a and lot. you often mm. have an overqualified person who's actually more than happy because they've got flexibility yeah mm. and so you get somebody who's a great resource in your how business. do you find that person um so i would um linkedin would be a great start LinkedIn. some facebook groups or go into a mother's group on you know in northern beaches or wherever you happen to be but good people know good people just imagine you know, like ben <laughs> nash <laughs> tries to apply to the young mother's group they're like <laughs> no mate <laughs> no <laughs> not with that beard. Maybe not the right one that I was thinking about then. But anyway, <laughs> they're out there. Um, I, I've heard a really strange uh, re- recruitment process. Uh, I think it's Zappos, the, the shoe oh, store. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Where, um, where once someone comes on after a month, they pay, they offer two or three months salary to leave. Yes. And then... And then wait for the response. So, yeah. yeah. So it's only the really group. innovative. And guess mm. what? If people stay, they are well and truly committed. Mm. Yeah. The people that were potentially hiring mis hires go out the door really yeah. quickly because they yeah. can take self selection. And self selection yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So I was reading your business employee matters. I I read online that you have hired, fired, and managed over fifteen thousand mm-hmm. people. Is that right? Yeah. If you think about all the years I've worked, and 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 often I was in corporate roles, so I was a HR manager for a lot, you know five hundred people. Mm-hmm. So it adds up over time. And Are you uh, still counting. I've given up counting now. And do you know what? To be honest, I <laughs> don't do the, the work anymore. <laughs> yeah. There's a little I, counter. Yeah, yeah exactly. Up <laughs> yeah. Um, my team do the work now. Yeah. I just talk about it. it <laughs> Michael Clayton, that that movie, I believe, and he flies around and fires people. Oh, yeah, up in the air. George Clooney. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Yes. Um, yes. It, did, did you have a, a gun for hire like that? Yeah. It, it's. I watched that movie. I had a lot of people say, have you seen that movie? And I saw it very late in the process. But it did feel like that. But I think it's interesting. You you can fire well and you should fire well. People need to learn how to have this skill because as a small business owner, you can't afford, if you've got six in your team, you can't afford two of them to be mm. non-performers. That no. massively impacts your productivity. Or one. Even one. Yeah. One's 20%. Exactly. And a detractor often as well, right? So it yeah. drags it down. So it's 25, 30%. Exactly. Just and everyone else in the team's going... Oh, God. Yeah. What about mm. George? I'm carrying George's load again. And, you know, and so as soon as you get them, get rid of them off and your team are like, well, thank God, why didn't you do that years ago? Ben's been saying that about Patty for four <laughs> years now. <laughs> Maybe we might need to get you in yeah. and bring the briefcase next time. Yeah, so, so, what can go, so what can go wrong? Um, like how does alcohol play a role in the mm. workplace? Both, um, I think Aaron has put the beers in the fridge at our office. And so <laughs> what's the things that can go wrong yeah. When, when maybe alcohol is involved Look, in, I think in your workplace. Th- a couple of things. You want you need a drug and alcohol policy um, in this day and age. That's the first thing. The second thing you need to do is appropriate workplace behaviour training. I am. I love a drink, so I'm not the fun police. In you know, there are some in, in businesses and industries that should be alcohol free. There are others where it's part of it and it's social, but it is an extension of the workplace. So even if you go out for drinks with a lot of people from work, that is deemed to be an extension of the workplace, and all the same behaviour requirements even if you're not are there. Paying for drinks, yeah, or potentially. Yeah, that could have been an interesting thing for one of our uh, previous employers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Definitely. Um. And and what what happens if no one from let's say the boss doesn't go, but say four still or five could be, still could be an extension. Wow. So an example I'll give you is I went away to a work conference and uh, I <laughs> I left early. I was a mother of three young kids and I my dancing days were sort of <laughs> limited, and then one of the team that were there there were over 100 people at there he i don't know what happened but he lost the plot and he ended up running around the room and he bit 
his boss on the cheek, he stuck his tongue down someone else's throat, he threw a girl on the floor and gyrated on her. Less, mass destruction. Whoa, mass know. destruction. So I woke up the next morning and said, I think we need to have a talk about someone's behaviour. And obviously we went through a whole investigation and we had to interview people about the experience and so on. And he was fired. And the reason for that was that there was, you know, a real concern for some people for safety, you know, I'm after that. Surprised. And whilst he was mortified, <laughs> the reality was that he did it. And yeah. And, uh, and and it couldn't the business and he couldn't recover from that relationship. So um, do appropriate workplace tra- behavior training. Teach people what bullying is, what it isn't, what sexual harassment is, what it isn't, what performance management is, um, and that's that will help lower your risk exposure. So if you've trained everyone and everyone signed off a piece of paper that says I've been to training and I've understood and I agree to abide by, then if somebody in your team does something wrong, they'll go after that individual, not you as a business. Because you as a business owner have a duty of care to provide a safe place of work. Mm. Every business owner does. And that's managing stress. That's managing opportunity for sexual harassment. The other tip, we talked about it before, the Me Too movement. Um, The Me Too movement is going to increase, is my view, and it's going to increase the awareness and the acceptance of sexual harassment in the workplace. And I would suggest to you guys that we are just seeing the absolute tip of the iceberg. So there will be an increasing cases because people feel that it's now an appropriate time to bring forward a case so you need to if something happens like that you need to get some advice pretty quickly and start to manage it so um my wife uh how do how do i how do i stop this from happening <laughs> With your in, wife. in the home office <laughs> <laughs> or, or potentially relax the uh the policies yes <laughs> i think i think there's a special circumstance there i work with my husband too and he gets hot in the summer takes his shirt off i'm like come on it's sexual harassment <laughs> <laughs> well, well let's hear a bit like what is that an example yeah so I, I think it, yeah you know question. it's it's a really good question i think it comes down to um it, harassment that is un um that is not warranted so you know in terms of i would suggest that you know if you uh, avoid touching people if you can i'm a touchy feely person i just gave ben a cuddle when i walked in because i've met ben a few times but i think your preference is to pull back and just be really careful because what one person is comfortable with another person won't um we had a situation with a client a little while ago where uh there's some people secretary working and all the guys were commenting on her outfit now the test i would have used is would that fellow have made the same comment about her outfit if his wife was standing there mm-hmm. do you get what i mean by that mm. oh like the wife test yeah, yeah that's good almost like a wife test because i am not sure they would have made that comment and so um and i think women have for a long time just laughed it off and they're going to start pushing back i think a little bit more than what they have so you know appropriate um uh, jokes you need to be careful about the content and jokes i would avoid touching people unnecessarily unless they're comfortable we had another client the other day that had a staff member send herself uh, selfies of her naked Send and herself, so said, sorry, yeah. said, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I said that wrong. Yeah. She took photos of herself naked and Selfies sent them to her boss. And sent them to her boss. And accidentally? No, deliberately. Okay. And uh, and he didn't know what to do with them, but he then engaged in a bit of conversation, and that hasn't ended well, because she's now claiming sexual harassment. What? But yes. She, you know, so it uh, it's sense. a messy area. Wow. I think I want, you, you know, it is a messy area. That's a so minefield. Going, yeah. so you need a, You definitely, you, as a boss, you almost need a support person to yeah. Okay. Talk well, um, talk through as these things are happening. Yeah. What 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 do you do? Like what should have that guy done? Look, he should have said that that sending me photos like that is inappropriate. Now uh, and then just put it killed it. You yeah, know, right. as a, you know it. I'm re- I've seen, you can't take it back. He's seen it, but I'm really sorry. I can't engage in that sort of you know, behaviour. Mm. That makes it difficult, I suppose, for the workplace relations. Exactly, because she may choose to leave after that. And if that's the case, maybe that's the right outcome. Yeah, yeah it's difficult. But it put it, he put himself in a predicament by... Not addressing it. By not it. addressing it. Okay. Guilty um, by lack of reaction. Yeah. Mm. Or, although he did react, but yeah. in an inappropriate yeah. way. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, so your business, Employee Matters... Um, what, obviously, you know a lot about people. What, mm. what is it that you guys do? Yeah, so essentially we help businesses achieve success through their people. So we help them hire, manage and exit better. I'm a huge believer in your employees are your greatest asset. They're also potentially your greatest 
uh, liability. We're all about building, at the centre of what we do is building uh, treasure, and that's that pe- we hire people that treasure your business as much as you do, but also that you build a treasure trove in your business. And we do that through a number of different ways, but essentially we build highly engaged, highly um, motivated um, and very productive teams for businesses. So do you sort of get into the nitty gritty of the architecture of the culture? Yes. Um, help help codify that in some way yeah. and help uh, communicate that. Yes, I think culture is really important and, and it can be in a major attractor to work for you. So I think business owners need to get very clear about what's their employee value proposition mm. when they're meeting with new employees or potential employees. Working here, this is what it's like to work mm. for us. You know, and so that they're bought into that culture piece really early on. Because if you're a startup and you're hardcore and you're working, you know, long hours and stuff like that, and somebody's at the end of their career potentially and not interested in that anymore, it's not going to be a fit. Correct. Yeah. And so how your business uh, is is a bit of a bit of a behemoth. You said you you were working with your husband. You got twelve virtual staff. Mm. Uh, you obviously it's very successful. How how have you gone about building your business? How did that all progress? Yeah. Um. I I was lucky I, in the sense I think I learnt corporate best practice and now I apply in a way that makes commercial sense to small business. Having said that, Ben, I've made an incredible amount of mistakes along the way for the same reasons that your people do. I'm a HR person. I'm not a marketing legal, mm. social media, that's all the stuff you've got to learn as you go. Uh, but I do think, you know, we work in, in a very, um, uh, we uh, there's a very extensive employee relations framework in place here and people need to get their head around that and they need to understand their modern award and their fair work obligations. But in terms of how I've built the business, it's trial and error. Um, I've surrounded myself with great people though. I have an incredible team that, you know, I, you knew, I was chatting about it when we were off air. My, my daughter had a bad accident and I was out for four days and the team just pick up and they just run with it and I had no worries that the business was not going to thrive while I wasn't there and it's because of the people I've Mm. got there. And so how did you go about growing your team? Yeah, I tapped into that gold mine of talent which is those mums who have had very successful corporate careers but don't want to work a 60 hour week anymore and so they we've built a portfolio of clients for them when they come in and out of that client's business as their HR manager and it's so seamless that people uh-huh. actually feel like that's their HR manager it's you know XYZ's HR manager it's not you know employee matters person um, and you know a big part of what we do is put the costs which is important for you guys because they're all financial advisors you know a lot of times people think there's a lot of soft and fluffy with HR I'm all about there's actually a lot of cost involved and we can show you how we can save you a significant amount of money particularly around breach fines and also um, you know getting a highly productive workforce or not having somebody's role vacant for too long because that's very costly as well I've heard just simply paying someone to go is like a really good strategy and that you can do that in australia it's called a deed of release and 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 you have a conversation and you Mm. so it's mutual you have what we call a um a mutual separation conversation and it's under a without prejudice conversation Mm -hmm. so we'll say uh, this is mm. without prejudice this is really not working for me we could go down the performance management route that'll take us a couple of months and you might end up performing or we can cut our losses and I'm going to pay you $2,000 and you go away quietly and can't sue me sign here and they need to get legal advice on that deed of release but it's a quicker more expensive but a quicker way and sometimes a better way to solve a problem yeah I've seen mm-hmm. that. I've seen that used in, in practice. I've, in fact, I've had that used on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, when, when I say I got fired, you that's actually what happened. Yeah. Deed in the yeah. past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like we can, uh, we'll pay you. We'll, we'll pay you your bonus, and we'll call it a, a this release payment. But you have to sign this thing to mm-hmm. say that you won't. Uh, yeah, so, and that's so. an interesting thing. If you flip it around and and think about the employee's side, all of our clients, vast majority are employees, and they're who 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 looks after them. Mm. Well, you know, besides obviously the fair work, the fair work does is and, meant and, to protect the employees. It is meant to protect the employees, and let's not forget that you know fair work is very much pro the employee and not the employer. Mm. Um, and you know, I would suggest that their HR manager should be protecting them in their businesses. Um, but if they've got an unscrupulous boss, then you know they may need to take some advice from fair work, which is one three one three nine four. I think is the number. And so, if I've got if an employee has an issue, mm. just randomly 
Certainly. If they're I, able to call Fair Work they and can say, and get this some is advice, my situation. But I would always go and speak to your boss first mm. because they may not be aware that it's an error or that it's making a mistake and they might, might be very happy to make good on it. Mm. So, and I know we were talking, you, you were talking before about restraint of trade. Yeah, well, that's another thing for financial planners as yeah. well. And, you know, lots of people get a contract that is 10 pages or 15 pages. And then I've seen the restraint of t- trades that say you can't operate in Australia. And if that fails, you can't operate in <laughs> yeah, New South I've Wales. And if that fails, you can't operate in <laughs> Sydney. And if that fails, you can't operate on in Martin Place. And it's this cascading yeah. if formula to try to protect the employer. But then just in the industry, it seems like you can't. Uh, enforce a restraint of trade very well or it's very expensive it is. and the onus is all once again on the employer because the employee needs to eat his lunch so yeah. they're entitled to go and work and so what do you think about so i think in the past trade? you're absolutely right restraint of trades weren't really worth the paper you, that they were written on and you'd sort of put it in there and really just cross your fingers and hope that they believed it and they <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't do anything about it um nowadays there is actually a push and the judges are or the commissioners are making more orders to protect the businesses mm-hmm. ip confidentiality so if you have an employee that sticks a um, usb stick and downloads all of your clients and takes them that should be in your contract that's not good and you should be able to protect that as a business owner mm. equally around restraint of trade for your employees it needs to be fair and reasonable. They've still got to earn a living. Mm. You know, I, I grew up in the banking and finance industry in dealing rooms and, and they did it well and it worked because they put people on gardening leave and they were out of the market, but they were paid for three months. They couldn't do any work and the hope was that they would lose all of their contacts and their beer mm. buddies over that time and uh, mm. and then that would protect them. Um, but I would suggest get a good one written, but it needs to be reasonable. But I would also encourage everyone here, if you haven't had your employment contracts looked at in the last two to three years, get them looked at because the law is evolving over all the time. So we used to do employment contracts um, and we don't do them anymore. Um, And, you know, the iterations that I've seen coming through our lawyers that do them, massive changes Mm. and and big changes around protecting your IP, protecting your confidentiality. And you would actually say at an annual review, get your employees to sign a new contract. Possibly <coughs> not. An, 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 it, it could be timed around your annual review because what you might want to do is say, look, we're reviewing our contracts because we want to make sure that we're up to date with best practice. Uh, we're going to give you a, a chance to review the contract. You can take that off and show your lawyer. We're going to do info sessions about what's changed. Um, and, you know, for anyone who signs up on this new contract, there's a little sweetener in it for you. And so if they you, say no, then they remain on the older contract potentially. Right. So you can't so, you can't force people to sort of upgrade hard. their contract. It's hard. Yeah. And and look, but what you want to make it is is it's worthwhile to upgrade it. So you might want to put something else, ooh, an extra benefit in there that would be helpful. So that's. Uh, I was going to ask you. My final question is around what do you what do you see as the top three things that um, that business that people that run businesses, business owners, that they don't know that yep. they should. So the top three things is uh, modern award. So you must be compliant with your modern award. So I think for you guys, it's probably the banking and finance award. Maybe. There used to be thirteen hundred of them. There's now one hundred and thirty. It'll be in the show notes. It'll yeah. yeah. be in the show notes. We'll do a <laughs> link to that. <laughs> Whatever the award is, we'll do a link to it. You must have a copy of that in the office. Your team must know where that is so if the fair work ombudsman walks in the door and says who's the boss and ben stands up they go all right where's the fair where's the modern award isn't it on the internet uh yeah it needs to be your you know it needs to be well it needs to be in your office (laughs) um whether it's in your kitchen or whatever the other one is they don't send out the fair work info statement which must is legally illegally has to go out with every employment contract for a permanent um and each of those two things that i've just mentioned uh expose you to a breach of the fair work act which could be up to six three thousand dollars and they've just increased those to six hundred and thirty thousand for extreme cases oh you Thanks mean the award pizza. no no i do i do have that there it's in go. the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> so please wild There's coffee stain <laughs> yeah coffee stains on the bottom but it's there <laughs> the third one would be independent contractors because if you are deemed to have an independent contractor who's truly an employee um then that risks a fine again of that sixty three thousand dollars and also, he's the stinger in the towel, back pay of entitlements. So if that independent Whoa. contractor has been with you for two years, guess what? They've accrued, um, you know, four weeks of annual, annual leave, leave for each year. They've accrued 10 days of sick leave for each year and long service leave. 
Wow. So it's an important one. So make sure if you have any independent contractors. Right. Is, is, there, is there is there is there uh, like a holiday? period you know where three months someone comes on as a contractor and then oh they become a of an employee they're still going to meet the criteria of a true independent contractor and they've made it so it's a it's a very multifaceted test so things like do they have their own business card or do they have your business card if they look like they're your employee that's not a good thing if they use your equipment that's not a good thing. If you uh, if you're directing their work on a daily basis, that's not a good thing. What's the difference between an independent contractor and someone working on a contract, though? Because people work on contracts, right? That's okay. Is that okay? And, well, that's probably an independent contractor. Mm. So like a three month contract. Yeah, three month contract. Again, if uh, it could okay? be, well, it depends whether they meet the test. So oh. here's a great test. So if you here's provide them all the to- <clears throat> if you provide them their what they got to do, their computer, their laptop, their business card their phone they're starting to fail they're starting to look more like an employee exactly um if they use your work email address they they answer the phone in your work name not their independent contracting name if it looks to the public that like they're your Mm. employee here's the biggest test of all and this is what i learned when i first started doing this if that independent contractor is a test he's a really good one can it can't come to work one day and he can give the work to someone else without your permission and he works for you he's an independent contractor Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. So it's about this. It's a multifaceted test. Mm, um, I would encourage people yeah. to get some so advice on the independent on can contractor can contract someone else to do the work. Correct. Yeah. Without your permission. Without my permission. Mm. So most people that are working to help financial planners, like if we engage a marketing person to do something, that's a contract. That could be a supplier yeah, arrangement. Yeah, that's a more of a... And is that always contracted as well? It should. You should yeah. be under a supplier agreement mm. separate to an independent contractor or mm. a permanent okay. employee. That's when you supplied your services to someone. Awesome. So, great tips. So, Natasha, thank you. Um, How can people get in touch with you? Yeah. Best way would be the website, employeematters.com.au or natashahawker.com. On the website at the moment, which might be of interest given we've talked about a lot of the legal stuff today, um, there is a little uh, tool called Employee Metrics Mini. It's a short questionnaire. You can do it yourself and find out how you're tracking in terms of your HR levels of compliance, risk and best practice. And that will be a great indicator because I think a lot of business owners are, you know, naive about what their exposure is and they're probably exposed to fines and they just don't know it. It's not a deliberate uh, contravention, but it's a contravention all the same. And, and your book? Uh, my book is called From High to Fire and Everything in Between. It's uh, sold at Dimmix or Amazon and there's a PDF version that you can download from the website for about four ninety five. Boom. Mm-hmm. And did you put something together for our XY guys, a download? Um, I hadn't, but I can. And what I think we might do is the um, How to Win the War for Talent, which is all the great questions to ask in an interview. Okay. So awesome. we'll put those yeah. in the show notes. Thank you. Show notes. Awesome. Well, Natasha Hawker, thank you very my much. My pleasure. Thanks for having a me. A special shout out to, to Dean Colin Holmes for joining us. Yes. Dino. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.